Welcome, I'm Lori Lee Binstock, and this is a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. Thank you for joining us for our Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast now on Mental Health News Radio Network. This podcast is also available wherever you get your podcasts, but I do suggest checking out Mental Health News Radio Network to find all your podcasts related to mental health. Today's guest is Jana Wilson. Jana is an emotional healing educator, meditation teacher, retreat leader, public speaker, hypnotherapist, and founder of the Emotional Healing System. She is also the author of Wise Little One, a prescriptive memoir. Jana, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Laurely. Aren't you a woman of many trades? <laughs> well, they, they all complement it's all kind of condensed into one. <laughs> it all works together and flows yes. together. Well, I want to know, how did you get into this work of thriving and helping others thrive and find their purpose? Yeah. So it, I mean, obviously began why I wrote the book is with my childhood and adverse childhood experiences. I scored 10 out of 10 mm. So for listeners who are listening and don't know what adverse childhood experience is a test. You can look it up. It's called the ACE test. And it asks certain questions for clinicians to ascertain where somebody's at in trauma. So I experienced, um, you know, the highest level of trauma as a child. And I, I look at it and began looking at it at a young age as a gift to awakening. And I woke up at a young age. I had a spiritual experience where I was pulled out of my body when I was 12 in the midst of a domestic violence incident between my parents. And from that moment on, I just really kind of had an awareness or a knowingness about really the essential nature of what life was, what was real, what wasn't. I had so, you know, adults around me, I could, you know, I could give them a lot of um, feedback and understanding on what was going on within their psyche at a young age. And of course, it made them angry because they didn't want to talk about the elephant in the room. And here's a kid talking about it. So, yeah. So from a young age, it really, you know, sparked my interest. Um, to heal and to, to, um, you know, really figure out why I'd been given the parents I'd been given and the journey, you know, led me to doing a lot of healing myself. And then of course, you know, healer, heal thyself. I think there's a lot of broken healers and, um, you know, it's, it's a journey. It's not a destination. It's a lifelong pursuit, right? Yeah. Well, I do think that, broken healers or pe or people who have experienced trauma who become healers are the best healers right their yeah. their their level of empathy spans so wide um for me i have an internal family systems therapist who i absolutely adore and you know i feel like i connect with her on a special level more than i have with any other person that i have worked with um, so as an emotional healing educator and emotional healing, what type of healing do you do with your, your clients? Or is that what yeah, you're so the clients? emotional, yeah, the emotional healing system is something I developed through years of, you know, doing my own work and realizing like, you know, one teacher may have a tool that really supported me, you know, to uncover, say, false beliefs that I developed at a young age and developmental trauma, right? And one teacher would have a tool, you know, to help really create more space in my mind. One teacher would have a tool to help me with my triggers. And so as I went on my journey, it was kind of like I was collecting what worked for me on a daily basis to practice so that I could have joy. I believe joy and happiness is our birthright, but I, I feel like it takes work and most people aren't willing to put in the work. You know, they're, um, you know, it takes a lot of discipline to 
to achieve our goals, to achieve whatever it is. And healing's no different. So it takes discipline. But what I found is once someone loves themselves, and that's why inner child work has been so profound. I began with inner child work in the 90s, in my 20s. And I, you know, I when I was able to connect with little Jana, I could see my innocence. I could see my deservability, my lovability. But as an adult, I had many experiences to judge myself or criticize myself and listen to that negative, you know, critic inside. And so the more I began to connect with my innocence and my essence, my pure essence of that sweet little girl, then I wanted to advocate for her. I wanted to fight for her. I wanted to give her the life that she never had. That's why my motto is, you know, it's never too late to have a happy childhood because many of us, even if we had well-intentioned parents, say they weren't addicts like mine or suffering from mental illness like my mother, they were just parents who were working, trying to make ends meet, weren't taught emotional intelligence when they were children, right? So they, you know, we still pick up traumas, you know, a parent who denies our reality is a trauma. You know, uncle so-and-so hugs me and I don't feel comfortable. Oh, it's fine. You know, mm. stop being like that. That's denying your reality, right? I feel this way. Oh, you'll be okay. You know, be a big girl. You know, when they don't see or hear us, when they live vicariously through us, when they don't model good boundaries, when they um, can't regulate their own emotions and have temper tantrums. And that's all traumas to a child. So in working, this will be my 20th year in doing emotional healing work with clients. I've discovered that most people, you know, have had fairly benign childhoods. A lot of people even say, I don't remember my childhood. Mm -hmm. Well, typically that's not because something traumatic happened. It's it's actually because probably nothing traumatic at all happened. It was pretty boring, right? Not much was going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and we can access those memories through hypnotherapy, through bypassing, you know, the conscious mind and the subconscious has a wellspring of memories and all kinds of stuff that we can use. I always share this one story. I had a client who felt her feelings didn't matter. And so she came to work with me for a week. And in the first hypnotherapy, we went back and she remembered being five years old and swimming at a lake with her parents and her cousins. And she'd never been in a lake. So she was afraid to go in and she told him no. And rather than giving her the space to figure it out on her own and go in when she was ready, they forced her in the water. And as soon as they forced her in the water, what happens when we're little is a traumatic event happens, something like that was traumatic for her because they weren't listening to her and she was scared of the water. She thought some monster was in the water. Mm. So what happened is when an emotionally charged event occurs and we're children under the age of seven, we don't have the rational defenses and structures in the brain of an adult formed. So we personalize everything. And as soon as you personalize something, you make it mean something about you. It becomes like an operating system. So her operating system became, she looked through the lens of her little five-year-old eyes and said, well, my feelings don't matter because if they did, they would be listening to me and they wouldn't force me in the water. Then she doubled down on that. My feelings don't matter and said, other people must know better than me. Right. I should trust my intuition or my feelings i should listen to mom or dad or other so here she is in her 40s in the midlife crisis and saying you know why am i so unhappy i have everything i need a loving husband everything but at her core she hadn't learned to even listen and honor herself so she didn't speak up for herself she was a people pleaser a doormat and then she would get passive aggressive and resentful and you know a cycle and once she became aware of that, just the awareness of that memory, and she replaced it with my feelings matter. And she began to say it every day. And then she began to advocate for herself. Because if you're telling yourself your feelings matter, of course, when someone treats you like they don't, you stand up for yourself. So her relationships changed, her life changed, and she's, you know, very happy now because she's no longer being a doormat. Wow, that, that actually reminds me of just 
probably about a month ago, I was with a friend and I was, we were, I was talking about my husband and um, how I was like, I, I don't know what our conversation was, but she, apparently she was just like, why are, why is it that Jared, my, my husband is good. And you, you, you speak as if you're bad. Like, it's not like equal footing there. And I was just, and it just dawned on me. No one, I mean, I think my therapist had asked me, why do you put him on a pedestal? And it dawned on me that, you know, early on in our relationship, we had been together for we almost 20 years, but my my parents um, were really upset. We had a little break and my pa- mom was like, and my, and, and my dad, they were like, you know, this is the best person you're ever going to get. So <laughs> they're like, you, you like, you're not good enough for him. So you better try to get him like you better try to get him back. Like they mm. really kept in reinforcing the fact that I was lucky to have him and that I was not good enough. And that is why I lost him. So if I don't get him back, that I'm not going to get anywhere close to who my husband is. Wow. And he's amazing. Yeah. But I, I re I when I went, it was like a flashback when I was with my friend, and all of a sudden it was like, this actually happened. This is what I'm thinking. This is just what came up for me right now. And I shared that. And she's like, well, no wonder you feel that way. And it was because that I, when, and, and the thing, funny thing is, when I talked to my husband, he's like, when when we're in an argument, you know, I, I make these stories up in my head about what he thinks of me. And, it, and he would always say, where did you get that? I did not say, I didn't, I never said that. I never said any of these things that you keep saying that I, that I'm thinking. And I would be like, well, you're thinking it. And I have realized it really stemmed back to that moment where my mom and my father were telling me like, you know, you're, you're not good enough for him. Well, even f- further back. You got oh, yeah. to the age of seven. Yeah. Right. Oh, way. Yeah. I mean, but that I think that reinforced my 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 thinking with him. I have a lot of not enoughness and having to undo that because of my childhood, because that was just one little piece of how they they talked to me um, and everything that I did. Uh, but I was something I was reading um, was that. You know, according to neuroscience, 95% of our behaviors are dictated by our subconscious. So mm-hmm. there's like all this stuff that we do that we don't realize where is rooted. And I think when you, you talked about hypnotherapy, which I think is just so fascinating. Um, is, is that something that you felt helped you really dig deep? within yourself and for your, your, your client? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's why I became a hypnotherapist. It's when you can bypass, you know, the conscious mind, you go to therapy and you're staying in your thinking mind, right? You're, you're talking about issues for 50 minutes, essentially, Mm -hmm. right? And it's not enough time and it's top down therapy. And it's not to negate Western, you know, the therapeutic process, but it only works briefly. If you take a functioning person that has a fair amount of intelligence, they can learn tools and apply those tools. Therapists aren't taught to teach a patient, a client, a tool because, well, that wouldn't have them coming back next week or the week after, right? So um, I got really frustrated in traditional therapy and it was the people who did hypnotherapy or imagery with me where I had the most profound accelerated results. So I became a hypnotherapist. The work that I did with Debbie Ford, who wrote the book, Dark Side of the Light Chaser. She's a New York Times bestselling author. She's no longer with us. She passed away, mm-hmm. but I trained with her and was on staff with her and the work I did with her, we, she didn't do hypnotherapy, but she did guided processes So I took the guided processes similar to what I learned when I trained with her and I incorporated those along with reparenting um, the inner child, that kind of process into hypnotherapy. So when I'm taking a client through a process to go back into, you know, into the subconscious mind, back into memory, a lot of times people will say, you know, well, what if it's, 
you know, 50%, they say research shows that we don't really remember about 50%. So our memories are sketchy. And what we do remember is usually emotionally charged events, mm -hmm. right? right? So when you take an event that doesn't seem to an adult very emotionally charged, like the, the woman said, I hadn't thought about that event when I was five ever being, you know, a part of, of something that could have altered my, you know, belief in myself my belief that my feelings mattered, but it happens all the time. In Florida, we just had a group retreat and we had a attorney there and he, he shared that his, the memory that came to him, and this was in group hypnotherapy, which is more difficult because you don't have a clinician writing the notes for you. The, the participants have to remember and then take notes themselves. So group's a little different than private mm -hmm. in that way, but he remembered his parents' forgetting to pick he, he and his twin sister up a lot from school or being late mm. because they were working parents and there was just a lot going on. And he internalized it that, you know, he was unwanted, you know? So, and then if you looked at his life, you could see how he adapted to overcompensate for that. Right. right. So a lot of times it's a gift. Because his overcompensation, he became very successful, you know, big attorney in Miami. He was, you know, and and he's like, I have something to prove. I am wanted. I'm desirable. All these firms were fighting over him. Who who was he going to go with and be partners with? I mean, so he really pushed himself. But eventually that same mechanism, how we adapt, it's a maladaptive. It's kind of survival. Mm -hmm. Right. Like for you, I'm not good enough. Well, I'm going to show everybody I'm good enough. I had a similar one, you know, as a little girl, we were poor, we were labeled white trash. So for me, I began to look at the world through this lens of I'm less than I'm inferior to others. And I didn't like that. So I had something to prove I'm not enough. I'm, you know, I'm bad. I'm trash, essentially throw me away. And mm -hmm. so anytime that wound got triggered, of course, I would act out. The wounded child in me would act out. But I pushed and pushed and pushed through it. And, uh, you know, eventually that, you know, the very thing that we thought, because inherently nothing's all bad, right? right? So if we're saying a belief that we're not enough is all bad, then there's nothing good in it. And that's not true. Yeah. There's something good in it. You're, you know, you've got a voice in the world. You've put yourself out there. Clearly somebody who believes in themselves is capable of doing that. Somebody who believes they're not enough wouldn't be able to do that. So, you know, it's the dance between those mm -hmm. two polarities of I'm enough and I'm not enough. And, and both are true. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like I, I still struggle, right? I'm still in therapy. Like you said, it's a journey. Um, it's, it's a healing journey that is just ongoing. And, and, you know, I do find myself saying still like, is this enough? Am I doing enough? And then I'm getting, oh, then I'm, I'm trying to do too much. And then, then I can't do any of it because then I become paralyzed because it's exhausting. And then I'm like, it, it's like, then I prove my point. Like I'm not good enough that, you know, yeah. and it's, it's such a vicious cycle. Prophecy. Yeah, exactly. It is such a difficult it's such a difficult struggle how can we overcome that is it just really well, it's keep awareness. Digging down it's yeah. awareness first of all that life is how do we know it's daylight right now hmm. how what would how would you answer that we're able to see it we're we're open to 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 our eyes to it is yeah, that so that's what most people say. But really, the only way we know it's daylight is because we've experienced the opposite. Mm. Mm. We've experienced darkness. So wow. night comes and we know it's night because we experience daylight. So everything in this world it is a world of duality. It has an opposite. And so once we understand the same thing in the macrocosm, in the creation of the universe, you know, and it, in Switzerland, they created the largest um, device on the planet, mechanical device. It's magnets. It's called the Hadron Collider. 
and they wanted to duplicate the Big Bang. And so they smashed atoms. They finally got it working. It took like 35 years to build this machine. And then they got it working. It has like a seven mile circumference. And once they got it working, one of the theoretical physicists um, who had theorized the God particle, mm. it, um, it, it became true, no longer a theory. It was factual because once they smashed the atoms, they discovered that in this creation of this universe, what God created, what all of it, there's chaos and there's order. And the God particle he theorized through mathematical equation was it's not, see the atheists believe it's just chaos. It's random. Mm -hmm. Non-believers, atheists, scientists believe that this is just some happening. Like there's no, they, they, there's no reason to it. They can't does. And then people who believe like Einstein say, you know, believe that there's order there's intricate order in this unified field that everything's commingled and everything's orderly, but it's actually both. And if you look at Buddhism, Buddhism teaches that they teach, stay in the midline, find the center. And so that's what you're finding. If through awareness, you become aware, I'm pushing too much. Your little girl would tell you that we're not having any fun. All you are is a taskmaster. You just got a to-do list and you're always pushing me. I'm never enough, never enough. And I'm ready to dig my heels in and drink a bottle of wine, you know, something like that. You listen before it gets to that point. Mm. And then you maybe tell somebody, hey, I need to reschedule or, hey, I need to take some time out or, hey, I need, you know, more family time or more alone time. Like I just went alone on a trip for three days by myself just because I needed time with me. Right. Yeah. So that's it. It's finding the balance between action and inaction right feminine and masculine between light and darkness between and not vilifying one over the other yeah. right it's like when you're not motivated and creative there's a tendency for me too to have this internal wounded voice that says you're not doing enough like right. what's wrong with you like why are, you know look at all these other people compare compete you know with others and then I just come back to center back home and I remember, oh, no, you know, it's time for me to to step back to get my cre creative juices flowing. I'm pushing against life. I'm trying too hard. I mean, the word trying means to struggle. We should eliminate that word from our vocabulary because either we're doing it or we're not. Mm -hmm. There is no trying. Right. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, you know. And within the same um, issue that you contributed to the magazine, An Authentic Insider, which is beautiful. I suggest everybody read. Um, it's really nurturing your inner child. It's an, a piece that um, Jana wrote, and I absolutely loved it. But also in the same issue is uh, our trauma educator, Karen Gross. She writes about lying fallows, about how, you know, in, in farming, you know, there's a time to see, there's a time to sow, there's a time to rest. Like this is this is the universe natural um, order. Yeah. order. And so why can't we be more like that? Why is it that we have to keep doing, doing, doing when we are more productive, when we get that space, when we get to center ourselves? At least that's what I find. There are times where I'm like, I have no time to center myself. And then the universe says, okay, well, we're just going to do it for you. <laughs> and then I get sick <laughs> and sick, then I yeah. have to rest. <sighs> um, and, and and so that that is a really great you know, discussion, how you just, how you, how you really laid that out, because I, I really love that idea of always being able to that awareness and a, being able to center yourself. Um, and, and so that being said, I'm, I'm curious, because I, I think I talked to you earlier about, you know, manifesting your hopes and dreams. This is something that you have done. And I, I'm curious to know how, 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 how do you do it? How can someone really manifest their hopes and their dreams for, for what they really and truly want? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first, like, let's think of it in terms of like a metaphor of like you're building a house and say the house is your dream. Let's just use that. So the foundation has to be solid. So what is the foundation to manifest the life of your dreams is first of all, you have to be out of stress response. 
You know, most people are living in stress. Everything you and I just talked about, when you're pushing against the flow of life, that creates stress. Mm. Right? So we have to be in a state of homeostasis. And how do you do that? You create a meditation practice. You cultivate a daily, consistent, disciplined meditation practice, right? Every day, every morning, as soon as you wake up. It's the first thing you do. And then that creates a basis for you to have a coherent heart and brain connection. And so coherency happens whenever your heart since has more ascending fibers to the brain than the brain does to the heart. So the heart's picking up information in our environment faster than our mind does. So say, you know, something bad's about to happen, research shows that the heart will start picking it up in the field, in the ethers around you at least 20 seconds before it happens. Mm. So if you're tuned in, you'll feel the heart start to, and you'll, that's your intuition kicks in. Something's up, like pay attention, like what's about to happen. So when you're coherent and the heart is receiving a message, it's heart rate variability very smooth and coherent as a heart math facilitator i teach clients this as a basis with mm -hmm. meditation and it's just slow deep breathing right heart centered breathing gaining composure being calm so that's the first step you have to maintain that consistently throughout your life it doesn't mean that there's not going to be stressful events but you learn to regulate your emotions through your breath through these heart, they're called intelligent energy management techniques that the heart math teaches. And they're just, you know, and all it is, is about creating coherency. If you're not coherent, if you're incoherent, you can't manifest, <laughs> right? So real simple, foundational meditation, because it creates more awareness. It expands your consciousness, what you're aware of, instead of having very, you know, convergent focus on a problem, and creating mountains out of molehills or, you know, looking at worst case scenarios, you begin to create a divergent focus where you're open to infinite possibilities, right? So that's the first step. You have to be out of stress. If someone calls me, Laura Lee, and they say, I want to work with you. And I say, okay, let's have an interview, you know, and I start asking them questions and I find out they're in crisis. Absolutely not. Because I'm an educator, you're going to come here and learn. It's going to put you in stress just in learning because you're learning new things, right? right. It's called you stress. Um, and, and if you're in crisis, you can't learn. You can't hear. You can't retain information, yeah. right? So coherency is first important. Then your most valuable asset, more than anything, more than money in your bank, stocks, cars, homes, anything is your attention. Mm -hmm. So you've got to learn to master your attention in present moment. So the more you can be present, because it's the only thing that exists, the past is the prison. Mm -hmm. So the few, it's the known. If you want more of that, stay looking there, right? But, and the future hasn't happened. So we create the future through the present. So your attention being your most valuable asset, you keep it here. So now I have a coherent heart and mind. My attention's in the present moment. Now I set an intention for the future. And my intent has infinite organizing powers because our intentions like shoot out from us into this vast field of consciousness. And they're looking for a match. Like you say, oh, my husband's so brilliant. He's so, I put him on a pedestal. You are your husband. We are always in the mirror of relationship. So you see in him exactly what you see in yourself. Birds of a feather flock together. We attract our own level. If he was greater or better or something more evolved than you, he wouldn't be with you. Mm. It just isn't a match. So whenever you're seeing something in someone that you love, it's just a projection of your own psyche onto them thinking, oh, I wish I was more like them. You wouldn't be able to see it and get excited, have an emotional trigger if it wasn't in you. Same goes true for the opposite. Oh, I don't like that in them because I'm that way to myself, right? Mm. Or I've been that way, right? They're critical. I'm not critical. Oh, but I'm critical to myself, right? right? So they're mirroring it. 
So in order to manifest, you just have to have awareness and you've got, you have to create space in your mind. You know, we're on electronics, we're constantly being fed information, information. And if we're not creating spaciousness in the mind, the mind is just the monkey mind, right? It's just a lot of yakking, <laughs> no clarity, right? No ability to bring your most valuable asset to the present moment and look at the sky or offer up some gratitude for something because you're too focused on the past, what shouldn't have happened or what should have happened or the future that you want to happen or the worst case scenario. Mm. So foundation is, you know, be coherent, right? Get out of stress response, meditate, create more spaciousness, use your breath to calm yourself down. Two, keep your attention in the present moment. Be grateful for whatever you have eyes to see. Be grateful that, you know, whatever it is, appreciation and gratitude are high frequency. Mm -hmm. So they pull like a magnet to us, right? And so when we stay in those grateful states, more goodness comes, more to be grateful comes, right? Mm. And then our intentions are for the future. And those are the three Joe Dispenza talks about it, the author of Becoming Supernatural. He talks about, you know, in order to manifest, it's three things. And I absolutely agree with him. Coherent mind, right? Attention in present moment and a clear intention for the future. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. I love those steps. I love that you're you and that you went into them. And I'm actually, I'm really looking forward to really practicing that. Um, yeah. Is there anything that you would like to add that we didn't? touch on I'm sure you have a wealth of information that you could pull out but is there anything specific that you think our audience would really benefit from yeah I think I added this this was a part of the article I wrote for your um, publication I you know put it keeping a picture like I have several pictures on my desk like here's a picture oh. of me putting a picture on on your screensaver on your phone of yourself around five years old a time when you were very innocent, under the age of seven, and really connecting, beginning to build a relationship as if that little girl or boy was still alive and they're right here with you. Would you talk to them the way you talk to yourself? Would you treat them the way you treat yourself? And there's there's six ways we love ourselves. You know, self-love is more than just a bubble bath. Or So the first way is emotionally. You know, a lot of people's love language are words of affirmation. So it's looking in the mirror and saying, I love you. I'm so proud of you. You're a good person. You're so deserving. Saying those things that you wish somebody else would say to you, mm -hmm. but you giving it to the child. Second way is physically moving your body, eating nutritious food, organic, you know, really taking care of your body. We know good parenting does not produce obese children. Mm -hmm. right? That is just not good parenting. It's not about fat shaming. It's an addiction to food and not moving. And at the core underneath it is somebody who doesn't love themselves because the way we look, our appearance is a representation of how we feel internally. So physical, spiritual, you know, prayer, prayers of gratitude, connecting in nature, wooing spirit, right? Inviting spirit, lighting candles, incense, playing beautiful music, these are all ways we connect to that which we can't see, taste, touch, hear, or smell, mm -hmm. which is spirit, right? Outside the physical senses. And then um, organizationally being organized, you get in someone's car and it's a mess, you know a lot <laughs> about them, right? It, it, it reveals something. So we, children seek order. They need order. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't live well in chaos. Um, financially, you know, making sure your financial house is in order. You're not spending more than you make and putting yourself in those types of stressful situations. And lastly, relationships. Relationships mirror, as I said to you a moment ago, the love that we feel about ourselves. So if our relationship is mirroring to us, disrespect, you know, um, emotional unavailability, ignoring us, whatever it is, it's a mirror to us. We're helpless over others. So we want to clean up our relationship with ourselves first mm. because we teach people how to treat us. Right. So if we start treating ourselves loving, then other people will follow suit. Wonderful information and advice, knowledge, wisdom. I am so grateful to have had you on the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure.
Awesome. Well, that was Jana Wilson, emotional healing educator, hypnotherapist, founder of the Emotional Healing System and author of The Wise Little One. For more information on Jana and where you can purchase her book, check out the show notes. Jana also contributed to Authentic Insider's magazine December's issue 2023, which you can find in the show notes as well. Uh, April's issue of Authentic Insider is out. Check out Authentic Insider at traumasurvivorthriver.com. That's traumasurvivorthriver.com. And you can also listen to past episodes of a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my email list to get Authentic Insider in your inbox monthly. We will be back next week. You've been listening to a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. I'm Lori Lee Binstock. Thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. Take care. Thank you.